Mexico. Uh, é, eu moro, uh, eu moro uh, aqui em São Paulo. Uh, I'm going to use English for most of this um, presentation. Uh, I'm British. Uh, I live here. Um, but uh, I'm still learning gradually. Uh, so as I said, uh, I'm a writer. I've written a lot of books about technology. Um, and my talk today is really about uh, modern business and social media and how it applies to modern businesses today. And I'm talking today as part of the UK Brazil scene. There's a number of the talks that are here at Campus Party that are focused on uh, innovation between the UK and Brazil. So one of the things that's really important to observe, I think, uh, is the social media is all around us. Um, if you're working in a company, all of the customers that buy products or interact with you uh, engage with social media in some way. And it, even if somebody is not using an iPhone with Twitter, with Facebook, um, they'll see and interact with social media all around them anyway. Um, I've got here the, um, the Twitter feed for Metro de São Paulo. Uh, you can see uh, real-time information about the Metro feed there. Um, every time you watch the TV news, they ask you to give feedback using Twitter or Facebook. Um, shops, restaurants, uh, check in for a special offer on Foursquare. So all around us, it really be avoided. But there's many, many companies that still don't know or are finding it very difficult to try and do something with all of this. So the challenge is how do we make this work? We can't avoid it anymore. Um, but there is a big challenge and it's not just technology. The challenge really is around people and people using these tools. The social media tools are evolving very rapidly, so that makes it very hard for people themselves to keep up uh, and keep using the right tools. Um, clearly, we have um, uh, we've coalesced Facebook as, I suppose, the most popular personal social network right now. But who is to say we will be in five years or ten years from now? Um, perhaps Google Plus will have taken off by then. And social tools to work within a company, they require more than just technical knowledge. We're not just talking about applying some kind of technology within an organization. We need communication skills, management skills, organization skills to make these work within a company. And let's it, many companies are now run by people who grew up, entered business uh, well before the internet. Well before, I mean, I would normally say, 1994, the birth of Netscape, that was really the beginning of the, the World Wide Web as, as we know it and as it's very commonly used. There's plenty of people out there in senior company positions that can't understand how does it feel to grow up only knowing uh, this kind of constant connectivity. And people need guidance, companies, managers, they need guidance, but let's this area is so fast moving, but who do you trust? There's gurus and uh, experts and advisors there that have a lot of followers on Twitter, but don't necessarily know how to apply these tools within a company. So all of this can be quite difficult to, to, uh, to get it to work. It's basically very complex. Um, companies don't understand this very well, how they can apply social tools within what it is that they do. And I don't know if any of you follow um, uh, corporate analysts, companies like Gartner, but um, Gartner's a very big uh, corporate advisory firm. And today they actually published data on companies using social media tools. And they predicted that 80% of social media programs will fail. So corporate social media, um, four out of five will fail in the next year or so. Even the people that are writing about business and analyzing what's going on in the world of business are saying that most managers don't know how to make this work. Um, 
I suppose one of the key differences is that social media is not social networking. Uh, there is a world out there which is really the interactive web. Uh, it's the world of video sharing, photo sharing, uploading audio clips, all of this kind of content that people are creating. And this is not really social networking, which uh, I would define more as sharing of all that content and connectivity with friends and contacts. So uh, to start with, confused terminology. Uh, but then if you're thinking, how does your company use these kind of tools? There's the problem also that customers are no longer just consumers. They don't just buy your product or buy your service. Now they've got the right, and people are exercising that right, to comment on what it is to do, to comment on your products. And this can be in any industry. Um, it's, uh, it could even be, say, you're a manufacturer of chocolate bars. I'm sure that if you search for the name of um, Souffle, for example, here in Brazil, you can find photographs, video, uh, blogs, comments about that product that five or ten years ago, none of this feedback loop would have ever existed. So that really means that customer service itself is not just a hotline. Whereas before, if your Sky TV box at home you would get on the phone and ring up and complain and say, please fix my guy. Now you actually have companies like Lego, the toy company. Um, they get all of their ideas for new products from their customers contacting them and saying, hey, why don't you do this? You know, this would be a cool idea. Why don't we launch this? So instead of just a complaint channel, customer service itself has now become a social channel. So all of this is uh, an important introduction topic but I think that what I'm really trying to say is that we're not talking about one industry here we're not talking high-tech startups we're talking about manufacturers food producers retailers uh, the music business everything you can think of just about every industry changing the way that it operates because of this social that channel so if we're looking step by step how do you think about your own company? I mean, how do you make this work? Um, the first thing, I'm, I mean, I'm going to try and simplify. Obviously, every company is different, and every company needs uh, a different approach. But if we're just to boil this down to um, an approach that you can take away and think about to, from today, the first thing is to think about the kind of company you are. There's a lot of different types of company, private sector sector, big, small, um, selling from business to business, business to consumer. So you have a lot of different types of company. And then you need to think about what, it is, what is it that you want? What is it that you want or need? Why are you thinking about social media? Why are you trying to explore this as a channel for doing in your company? And then how are you going to measure it? And I, I would say that measurement really, uh, there's two kinds of measurements. There's what does your company want, and then there's also you personally. You know, how is your boss measuring you and measuring your bonus? Because if you're the person told to make social media work for your company, then, uh, I guess you want to make sure that you know how you get your bonus at the end of the year. So if we look firstly at step one out of those three steps, what kind of company? Um, we can subdivide it up, and I'm going to simplify it again. So instead of worrying about government, public sector, charities, uh, regulated companies, obviously this is more difficult if you're a bank or an insurance company, something that's heavily regulated. So if we just forget about all of that and say, okay, let's talk about big companies, small companies, or companies that sell to other companies, business to business, or business to consumer. So that's four different areas. So you'll probably recognize um, a, a, at least a couple of these companies. So I, what I'm, not, I'm not actually going to go into detail and sort of give a, a detailed case study of um, Coca-Cola or, or Valley, um, but I'm using these names as symbols of this kind of company. So for example, you know, a big beta um, Valley. Uh, I don't down the, the road and um, iron ore on the street. You know, they're not selling directly to consumers, 
whereas Coca-Cola, as a big business-to-consumer firm, is selling directly to consumers. And on the opposite side, we have um, the smaller, more medium companies. Uh, GP is uh, doing the... Uh, they create the technology when you, you punch into the Hiloji or Chito. Um, so you only sell to other companies. You're not going to buy one of the systems and have it at home. Um, but Pastificio Primo is uh, a small handmade pasta company. They have three outlets in Sao Paulo. Uh, they make everything by hand. And these guys, they use tools like Twitter and Facebook to try and create more local business themselves. So we have completely diff four different types of company here. Then once you kind of put yourself in that box and it, uh, you know, what type of organization am I? You need to think about what is it that you want to get from this? What, why are you looking at social media? Or what, what is it that when my boss says to me you to create a social media strategy, uh, what is it that is actually asking for? What, what is the, the reasoning behind it? And of course, you know, with most organizations, the bottom line is around money. We want to get more profit. We want to get more customers. Um, but of course, we're not directly doing that with most social media tools. Um, I can't just generate more cash using Twitter. So we need to think about, is it really around communications? And communication could be internal. So can I create better communication within my company? Or am I trying to communicate externally and create better communications to other parties? So am I creating a marketing strategy? Is this about better sales? Um, hiring and, and hiring, again, that's a big topic. You know, am I just going to start using social media like LinkedIn, for example, to find new staff for the company? Or am I using tools like um, Facebook to make my company look more exciting and make more people want to come and work at my company. So again, you know, you've got uh, big, big, big topics here. Each one is a topic in its own way. Branding, broadcasting. Um, and then at the end, I've put things like engagement and leads. So can you actually go out and find business using these tools? Then step three is really measuring success. How do you go about measuring what you're doing. And of course, a lot of the time when we're looking at social media tools, um, Facebook pages, um, LinkedIn company pages, a Twitter feed, uh, we're always talking about the number of likes or the number of follows, the number of people in the community. But many times, this might not actually be very important. It may be that um, you, know, you may want a bigger community, you want more fans, but you may actually be more focused on improving customer satisfaction, making your customers happier, making your customers more loyal, or making uh, your employees more productive. So there's many, many other things that you may be trying to achieve other than just going for more followers. So I got some slides that just goes through those four major groups of company exploring what are the kind of things that they would probably be looking for depending on each each company type so again this is not actually coca-cola I'm talking about but a, you know a consumer company like coca-cola um, clearly their focus is around big marketing campaigns around awareness um, with a company like coca-cola or let's say a big Company, for example, so any consumer product, really the aim is to get me to walk into a shop and buy a Coke instead of a Pepsi. You know, that, that's that's really the bottom line for. Them. So they may well be marketing, uh, they may well be taking advertising spend away from TV, away from radio, away from newspaper, and then using it in social channels. But at the end of the day, it's really about making me feel good about going out and buying a Coke. Uh, and so ultimately, in this kind of organization, you're going to be looking at sales. The, the bottom line is if you launch a big blogging program, as Coca-Cola has done recently in Brazil, ultimately I want to sell more Coca-Cola products because of that program. So there's a measurement at the end of the day that will come down to uh, increased sales in that kind of uh, environment. Typical failures and problems that a lot of um, large consumer-oriented have when they're doing this 
um, things like um, poor taste, jumping on the back of shoes to try and sell their products, um, asking or not considering that it's very complex actually to communicate with the millions of fans of this product um, and you find big, big brands giving the job to a young person with no business experience, no knowledge of the brand, you know, no deep knowledge of how the company operates and yet they've been put in charge of the company's Twitter feed. So, you know, it, this, this is, a, is a big problem. And that's, you know, how serious does the company take uh, their exposure to social media? Um, not being around, again, if they start communicating using social tools and customers start having an expectation, they can talk to the brand uh, any time of the day or night um, from any country, perhaps. Um, then you can't really have a kind of nine to five strategy. You can't take 12 hours to respond when the customer might expect response in a few minutes. And I put not defending the brand. Quite often you see with big consumer brands, uh, campaigns against them. It's very easy to launch uh, anti-Coke Facebook pages and this kind of thing. Um, and mo most, not mostly, but quite often you see very big consumer brands are afraid to defend themselves. They really hate uh, to, to, to stand up and, uh, and say why they're a good product. So get the message out there very easily. Um, it's actually just as easy to get the anti-message out. So protesters or people who don't like the brand. And, and brands still don't really know how to handle that well. Um, a good example I put at the bottom here of one of these kind of failures with a consumer is um, during Hurricane Sandy in New York quite recently. Uh, and you had this super storm washing over the New York region and American Apparel, the clothes store, they actually started sending out Twitter messages and Facebook posts um, advising people that they get a 20% discount on clothes uh, that they buy online right now for the duration of the storm. So they were actually saying, uh, because you're stuck at home, you can't go out because of the storm, why don't you come and buy products from us? And of course, you know, that kind of... Um, message, that marketing message, is quite crass, it's uh, you know, unfeeling, it doesn't show that um, the company cares actually for the consumers that are out there um, trapped by the storm. So a big B2B firm, it's quite different they approach these kind of tools and what they can get out of it. Um, and you have to think about how does a B2B, how does a company like Valley or um, uh, let's say a big call center company, for example, that sells its services into other companies that want uh, customer service, you know, how do they sell their, their, sell their service and sell awareness? Um, quite often it's because they, they show that they know their industry inside out. They show that they know the industry better than others in their field. So you create thought you create, you know, you show your managers know the industry better than uh, the competition. But more importantly, you can use this thought leadership and you can use this uh, publication of information about your industry to engage. So, who is it that influences the purchase of products from your company? Quite often there will be um, the business press, analysts, advisors, consultants, so somebody in a company that's going to buy from your company will turn to some sort of advisor, whether that's a company like Deloitte or KMG or an uh, analyst like Gartner or Forrester um, or the New York Times or the Financial Times. So there's all these places where these managers are getting information that helps them to make their decision. Really, that's where you need to be going to in a big beat like this and influencing the people who influence your customers. Typical measurements for this kind of company is around engagement. Um, I mean, if you're publishing this stuff and saying that you're a real thought leader and you know your, uh, your company and your, your industry inside out, if nobody engages you, if no one's interested, then clearly you know, you're just uh, shouting in a storm. You know, you're not actually making any impact. So clearly, with this kind of company, it's not so much about creating a big community, creating a lot of followers. It's much more around, is anyone noticing what you're doing and then engaging with you? 
typical failures um, with this type of organization, the kind of big B2B firms, quite often there's uh, this sort of corporate PR overload, uh, public relations, I mean. You can go to the page, say the Facebook page of a company that sells to other companies, and they've got stuff like uh, puppies or kittens and stuff like that on their Facebook, or a message saying, you know, have a nice day, uh, sunrise, you know, this sort of stuff. This is all meaningless. You know, this might work well on, you know, a consumer sort of company, but, you know, could you imagine a mining company doing all that sort of stuff on, on their page? Um, and again, they don't need to sell. They don't need to sell or broadcast information to a big, wide audience. They know who are the people that they need to influence. And even for a large company, it's probably quite a small number of people they need to influence. So, you know, putting out too much information and, and stuff can just be seen as spam. And a good example of a big failure, um, or in my, in my opinion, um, is BP after the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. And, you know, BP, the oil company, that they, uh, they were fighting this PR disaster the media of the world was against them, talking about this, this ecological disaster. And yet, all of the proof and fake Facebook and Twitter accounts were getting more traffic than the real information coming from the real BP. So people out there just writing stuff and pretending to be BP um, were getting more of an audience than the company's real communications. And you know that's a disaster for them at the time. So if you look more, um, again, a, a B2B, but a smaller, a more medium, or a smaller company, so they're still only selling to other companies. They need to appeal to the consumer on the street. Um, and again, they need to create thought leadership. They need to be seen that they're experts in their industry, just like the big company. But one of the things that's different about this smaller organization is they probably can't get the attention of the key analysts and advisors in their industry. They're probably too small for that. What they can do is build up a much better relationship with the people who write about their industry, the people who comment on their industry. So, for example, if you're a technology firm like this, you can build up a great relationship with the key bloggers, the key journalists, the key people who are commenting on and writing about your industry just through using the social tools. Um, and of course, in addition to that, you can directly find um, potential customers. Because you're small enough to probably know who are the potential customers out there, again, you can use social tools like LinkedIn to narrow down the people that you're after, uh, and then direct messages to them. And again, it's a very, very soft sell. It's more about demonstrating that you know your industry and you know what you're talking about, rather than just uh, banging on the door and trying to sell something. Again, um, visibility is one, going to be one of the key measurements here. Visibility and engagement. When you're publishing this stuff, do people actually take any notice? And that's going to be the important thing here. So the typical kind of failures on, uh, on a smaller um, B2B type firm, let's say, uh, you know, a small technology firm or, uh, or a public relations company or a marketing firm, if you're just broadcasting stuff endlessly that really has got no interest to your potential customers, then again, nobody is really going to care. It's just going to be seen as spam. And if you fail to target those people that you really need to interact with, then you're really just wasting your time. I mean, you can sit there on Twitter building an audience, uh, talking about your industry all the time, but if you don't talk to anybody who might influence a sale, then again, you're just wasting your time. And I think that one thing with a smaller kind of organization that's important to remember is not to rely on social media alone. Uh, social media, of course, it's an important topic. This is changing the way industry communications works. But in a smaller company, you really need those personal relationships. No one's going to give you a contract in a, in a smaller sized company unless they know you. And a case of 
some disasters here. Um, again, one of the, the classics is really around trying to write the news cycle. Um, surveys, uh, useless information. Um, bigger companies, get big advisory and consulting firms, they often can get away with this sort of thing. You know, they, they'll put something out into the media and say, we talked to 300 of our clients and found out, you know, this X percentage here, this percentage of managers are planning to do this or that. So they can do that kind of stuff. But in a small organization, all that stuff normally just falls flat. Okay, and so the last of that group of four different company types is the small and medium-sized uh, business to consumer firm. So you're selling stuff like Coca-Cola, except you're a small company. You've actually got products that you're selling to consumers. And the typical kind of company that I'm thinking of here is a bar or a restaurant or a, you know some sort of small organization, but where they're trying to build a community of followers and fans, people who like them. So in the example that I gave earlier, you know, you've got a company that's only got three outlets, they're selling pasta, um, but it's different from the stuff you get in the shop because it's handmade. Um, so you build a community of fans, you build a group, um, use Facebook, a Facebook page for example. So build up a community of people that you know like your products uh, and enjoy talking about them. And then use that for events as well. You know, you know that you've got a group of people then that actually enjoy your products. So you can create events around that. And you can do things like um, sales and discounts. You know, use the fact that you've got access to several hundred thousand people to then ping out a discount. You know, like if you're a bar, for example, you could send a message um, Friday afternoon, an hour before everybody finishes work. Uh, you know, until six o'clock, drinks are half price. That kind of thing used with the community very easily. Um, you're going to measure your success here in terms of the engagement, the size of your community, you know, how many people have you got there. But I think that um, what's important to recognize here with a smaller company is that each person that's a fan of yours can actually be much, much more important than, say, a fan of Coca-Cola, for example. You know, these are people that hopefully you recurring revenue from by nurturing them as your fans and this kind of business model um, I would say this is basically how the music industry is working today now if you're a young band that's up and coming and you haven't come from the era where you could make money selling records then working as a small organization like this is effectively what you're doing building a community of fans and followers uh, hosting events, which is actually concerts, um, offers to sell stuff, you know, which is selling t-shirts, selling signed records. All of this stuff is exactly the same way that industries like music are going. Um, failures, failures here, a lot of, there's always a lot of irrelevance. Um, clearly with a smaller organization, you're talking about having more focus. Uh, you, you should really know your audience and know your customers, but you still see lots, lots of companies selling out, sending lots of irrelevant uh, poorly timed content. Um, for example, the bar that sends out a message at 7 a.m. saying, uh, why don't you come out for happy hour this morning? And being too corporate as well, so to model themselves in big companies when really these are guys that know their customers and even be able to address them by name. Um, and I put an example here of failure uh, because I don't know about you but I notice at more and more bars and restaurants they're asking me to check in whether in, normally it's Facebook places but you know they're saying that I like their page or I check in uh, in some way I indicate that I'm at that bar or restaurant and you, I, I, I don't know hardly any that actually give me anything back for bothering to do that. So there's very, very few small companies that are really um, taking advantage of the fact that, you know, I've gone and liked every pub and bar that I've been in, um, but I'm not really getting any communication back from that, other than now and again they might send a photograph out of a pint of Guinness or something and say, wouldn't it be great to come and have a drink? So if I was saying, what do you really have to remember? 
throughout all of this. You're in business. You're working for a company. The company doesn't generally make money on social media. Obviously, uh, if you're a social media user, you might do. But uh, most organizations are not there to get more followers or to get more likes on Facebook. You know, you're there to either make stuff or sell services. Um, so you can't be a success on um, social interaction alone. How many followers you've got on if you're a bar, you're going to go bankrupt if you've got 10,000 people who like you on Facebook, but if they're not actually coming to the bar and buying drinks. So all of this stuff can help you to build your business, but it's not actually going to run your business. You need to think of how you can turn that interest in your business and that engagement into activities that can really make money. And clearly that's different, as we were saying, between small and big companies, but there's always some sort of way that you can turn the engagement into an actual value. And so you think carefully, it doesn't replace the real world. You start to think about what it is that your company does to earn a living. And I think one of the most important things that companies, especially managers, um, who are a bit unfamiliar, you know, quite often you'll hear people talk about uh, I've been advised to get a Twitter account and they don't really understand the value of using a tool like that. Um, I had a big consulting firm, a big international consulting firm and one of the directors asked me why should I be using Twitter because I tried it and nobody follows me and then I said to him what are you posting and he said well you know I'm just saying what I'm doing like I'm on the train, I'm having breakfast, I'm going for dinner and it's all just banal boring stuff, because um, as far as he was concerned, it uh, was all about just broadcasting what we're doing at the moment, rather than looking and listening and seeing what people are saying about his company. It took me about two minutes just to do a search of his company name uh, and to show him, look, there's like thousands of people out there talking about your company, why don't you just start talking with them, engaging with them, because you just turn it on its head. Instead of thinking that all of this is about broadcasting and advertising your company, you just listen to that big conversation that's going on and then you can interact with it. Um, a great example, uh, if you might have seen this, uh, Peter Shankman's a marketing uh, advisor based in New York. Uh, he had a long day once. He, he lives in New York. He had a meeting down in Florida. Uh, he flew down in the morning. He did his meeting uh, and then he was going to fly back in the afternoon back to New York hadn't had a chance to eat all day, so just before getting back on the plane in Florida and going back to New York, he tweeted uh, to Morton. Morton's was his favorite restaurant back in New York, it's a steakhouse. So he tweeted to the restaurant, you know, can you meet me at the airport and give me a steak when I get there? And of course, you know, he was joking. He didn't literally try and place an order on Twitter. But then when he got and landed in New York, some guy showed up. Uh, wearing a tuxedo, bow tie, and carrying a uh, big steak, carrying his dinner. So he walked off of the plane and uh, they gave him his food. And this is just because his restaurant was listening to what one of its fans was saying about them. And of course there's also uh, an active kind of marketing value from all of this as well. If you look at Twitter immediately after that happened, Suddenly there were hundreds and then thousands of people talking about this because that, the act of the, that company doing that, doing something unusual and listening to one of its fans meant that then um, everybody started talking about that restaurant in a positive way. Um, and this is one of the differences today that the message, whether it's good or bad, it can be amplified um, through tools like Twitter and Facebook. There was uh, just in the last week or so, there was the kind of sort of complete opposite of this good news story um, to do with a, a child who had Down syndrome and was seated in a restaurant with his family. And the family at the table next to him uh, asked to be moved. They actually said to the waiter that a uh, child with special needs shouldn't be in a restaurant. They should be back at home or in a hospital or somewhere. They shouldn't be in a public place like a restaurant. And the waiter said, well, if that's your opinion, then I'm not going to serve you. You know, you can find either somewhere else to get your dinner or you can find another waiter to serve you. 
Um, of course, they then reported him to the manager, and the manager just said, yes, yeah, I agree with the waiter. Um, eventually, the family walked out of the restaurant, and I guess they went to dinner somewhere else. But this family, they found out um, what the waiter did, and the, the mother of the child wrote a blog about it. And again, that, that, went, uh, that went viral, I mean, that, that comment. So, of course, then it went in the favor of both the waiter and the restaurant. But clearly, uh, you can see how easily these comments can be either negative or positive um, if, if you actually perform very badly in terms of your customer service. Suddenly, millions of people can find out about it immediately. So just, just summarizing all of that stuff, um, I know that it's been very quick. Um, rapidly tried to go through all of the various company types and the various kind of advantages that you can get from this. But the bottom line, the bottom line is really three points. That if you're going to do this, and it's very difficult to avoid this, you need to consider first what kind of company you are, um, how you're interacting with your audience, whether the audience needs to actually interact with you. Um, for example, the uh, Blood Donation Authority in the UK. They actually use Twitter a lot to appeal for donors. When they're running low on blood, they'll use all of these tools to tell people, get out there and donate blood. So, you know, that's uh, very much a kind of broadcast uh, type model. And yet that doesn't work for your local restaurant or bar. You can't just endlessly be broadcasting discounts. You need to engage at some point. So think about what kind of company you are. Think about what you want to achieve. What is it that you actually want to get out of doing this? Are you just trying to brand your company? Are you just trying to advertise? Are you trying to just build on your existing marketing strategy? Um, or are you actually trying to engage and create relationships? So it could be relationships with the top journalists in your field, relationships with analysts. It's just think what it is that you want to do. And then the bottom line, how are you going to measure it? Again, if you're going to do this, you're going to measure it just based on how many likes you've got. It really needs to come down to what do you get out of it. People have to spend money on this. Registering for an account or a Facebook page and all that stuff is free. But paying the people who are going to administer this, people who are going to create content, if you need an editor for your book, uh, if you need any journalists to write content for you, you'll need to invest a lot of money in this to create uh, a social presence, even if the tools themselves are free to use. So you definitely need to think about how do you measure it at the end of the day. And it's important, but just remember that the real world also exists. Thank you. I'd like to just invite you all um, to an event that's taking place next week. And I mentioned at the beginning that my talk the other talks that you're going to see at Campus Party are all part of the UK-Brazil season, uh, and that's looking at innovation between the UK and Brazil. Um, next week, there is a UK-Brazil season event that's it's, uh, it's a bit more it's less work-focused, and in fact, it's actually um, going to the pub to watch England play Brazil, uh, followed afterwards with a, a tribute band to the Beatles. You have the football followed by the Beatles music. So uh, I know that I'll certainly be there. If you look at that, uh, that URL, it's got all the details about where it is, what time, and all that sort of stuff. But it's another part of the UK-Brazil season, which is really the uh, sort of six-month legacy following the London Olympic Games. Um, I think we've still got 10 minutes or so. so um, if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. It's right over there. I don't know who, do we have microphones or something?
quando a gente fala de iniciativas é, voltadas de mídia social, de negócios para empregados internamente, primeiro, como é que a gente lida com a incoerência da atividade que a empresa tem externamente nas mídias sociais e o controle que faz dentro dos portais de mídia interna, né? E outra, é, como é que se convive como é que se convive com o um modelo hierárquico que, 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 na verdade, corta essa aplicação enquanto a empresa diz que quer propiciar um maior relacionamento entre os empregados? Um, well, I mean, I guess the hierarchy is a problem anyway. The hierarchy is a problem of organizations today. Uh, I think you can look at it like this. If you started a company today, you wouldn't build it the way that, or with the hierarchy of most companies that we see around us. And quite often, the only time that we see company, traditional companies change is when they go bust. So um, when they're failing, then they will suddenly change. But I guess, um, I guess that that, in terms of the hierarchy, I guess that really that's just a matter of time. I mean. There's, uh, there's people like us who remember the internet uh, at its birth, um, who, are, who can see a lot of these possibilities for changing the way companies are structured. But right now we have people graduating from university and, and going into work, uh, maybe at the bottom of the, of the career ladder. Um, but you know these people are born in the 1990s. They've got absolutely no memory of a time before Uh, mobile communications, the internet, and soon people will be going into work with no memory of a time before social media as well. So I think that it has to change. I think that in terms of hierarchies, they will have to change eventually. I think the Brazilian government will hold out until right at the end. But um, And you mentioned about internal social media as well. Um, Again, there's a disconnect in terms of what are you using. It's like I mentioned, um, what are you using social media for? And there's many, many different purposes. Um, and most of the stuff that I was talking about was external. You know, how do you use it for branding, communication, engagement? But again, there's many, many uses internally. Uh, I, I, I remember when the company I worked in um, they would send around an Excel spreadsheet with the skills of everybody who worked in the company. So, you know, you'd have your name and stuff that you know about. And that was the only way to share um, who was an expert on a particular topic. And uh, those days are really, really finished. I guess to make tools like Yammer, um, you know, or to use Uh, tools like LinkedIn, even internally, it really requires somebody at the top to buy into it and to agree. But if you get that kind of management level at the top that agrees and the push from the, then you can usually squeeze out the uh, the middle. You know, your mid level of management. Oi, Mark. É uma dúvida a respeito de um tipo de empresa. É, que, embora seja B2C, ela tem a finalidade de gerar audiência. O modelo de negócio é baseado em ad display, em publicidade. Eu falo de meios de comunicação, que buscam na rede social a geração de audiência. Acaba sendo quase um concorrente. Como que tu enxerga a estratégia de um veículo de comunicação que está nas redes sociais e busca tirar as pessoas das redes sociais e trazer para o seu próprio site? Do you mean, uh, do you mean like um, traditional media? So say like uh, t television, radio, that kind of thing. Um, I think it's very, well, it's very difficult. It's, media itself is changing and it's becoming more fragmented. And I think, um, I, I, I mean, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of one particular strategy that would work. But I know that if you're talking about uh, broadcast media, 
uh, say a television channel, how they can then use social tools to bring in viewers, um, but then to engage with viewers, then um, again, it's really about having good content. If you have good content that people actually subscribe to and believe in and enjoy watching or, or listening to, uh, which is why you see people pay so much money for football, sports, events, uh, concerts. You have companies here in Brazil like Terra that really just focus on, uh, are you with Terra? <laughs> uh, okay, um, but you know, a lot of their strategy is focusing on things like rock concerts. Uh, I'm sure that they're gonna be at events like uh, Lollapalooza, Rock in Rio, because you've got loads and loads of great content there that you can stream uh, and will get fans of those bands. Uh, and the same with sports content. And I'm afraid that I guess many other things like um, drama, for example, will just become a much more of a niche, niche, uh, uh, niche play, niche content play. Hello, uh, you were talking about the music industry and I was wondering um, what would you say to a band, for example, that um, because usually in a social media you talk to the people in your network. Um, so what would you say to a band that wants to communicate with people that they are going to give a concert for, like let's say in another country, another network that they don't even have access to? traditionally? Uh, I would say that they need to use the reach of fans. Uh, I mean, I know in my Facebook, if I look at my timeline, then I've got friends um, in Japan, in Canada, US, Brazil, UK. So, um, and I have friends that are in, in bands. And then when they go on tour, I mean, I can actually give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine is a singer in a band from the UK. They went on tour last year to the United States. And they're a British band, no one knows them in the States, but they entirely used Facebook to get an audience together. Um, and, and it was through partly fans that they already had telling their friends in the States, this is a band that you should see, but it was also about similar bands. So a kind of solidarity between bands. So uh, the most similar band in the United States is the Dropkick Murphy to the British band I'm thinking of. I basically just worked with similar bands and said, hey, can you tell the bands about us coming over? Um, so it was a combination of talking to other groups and talking to fans of fans that, that helped them to build up an audience. And then they, they did a successful tour. Okay, if there's no more questions, I guess that's it. And um, if you're around in Pinheiros, I'll uh, see you there to watch England uh, beat Brazil, I'm sure. Thank you very much.